1925. Pierre Bonnard acquires a modest house and garden at Le Canet in the hills overlooking Cannes. He calls it Le Bosque. From now until his death in 1947, he returns again and again to Le Canet. It is here that he spends the whole of the Second World War. This house, full of light and open to the landscape of the Midi, tells us more about the painter than many of the people who knew him. The studio, like the other rooms, is small. To the visitor, this seems to bring the landscape beyond, closer to the decor within. Although today the doors open onto an empty room, and the landscape framed in the windows is transformed, we can still conjure up Bonnard's paintings. These images echoing what the painter wished to express when he said he wanted his paintings to show what you see when you suddenly burst into a room. blossoms in the garden. A few days before his death, Bonnard tells his nephew, Charles Terrasse, to paint the yellow patch in the left-hand corner of the picture, as he felt too weak to do it himself. It is a final burst of colour, characteristic of the painter's lifelong search for light. This final eruption of colour on his last painting explains the title of this film, which is a quotation from the painter himself in search of pure colour. Bonnard at 80, the last year of his life, photographed in his studio by Henri Cartier-Bresson. On the wall, we can see reproductions of paintings which must have held some special meaning for Bonnard. 
they offer us a glimpse into the workings of the painter's mind. Gauguin was a great source of inspiration to me. Gauguin's painting, Jacob Wrestling with the Angel, brings us closer to the 20-year-old Bonnard. While still a law student, he registers at the Académie Julien, where he meets Maurice Denis and Paul Serousier. Shortly afterwards, he is accepted into the École des Beaux-Arts. One of his fellow pupils there is Édouard Vuillard. They all revere Gauguin, the master from pont aven who encourages them to dare anything and everything. This mood gives birth to the early oil painting, L'Exorcise. The young painter is influenced not only by Gauguin, but also by Japanese art. In his early twenties, he buys this woodcut for next to nothing and cherishes it for the rest of his life. Bonnard feels himself drawn to the simplicity of Japanese painting. Its use of color and line and its division of space open up new directions for him. He and his friends see themselves as prophets of a new art, as nabi, which means prophet in Hebrew. As a result of his predilection for all things Japanese, Bonnard is nicknamed the Japanese Nabi. The next thing we discover on Bonnard's studio wall is a reproduction of Cezanne's La Seine à Bercy. Cézanne is another artist admired by the young Bonnard. In Hommage à Cézanne by Maurice Denis, the Nabi are brought together in one picture. While Cerusier theorizes, Bronson, Denis, Roussel and Bonnard listen and pose. Back to the pictures and Bonnard's studio wall. Here we find Bathers and Yair by Sura. Sura experimented with color and invented pointillisme, where paintings are composed of a myriad of dots of color. Bonnard and Sura both explored new kinds of visual experience. Bonnard's Piazza del Popolo, painted in 1922, is reminiscent of Sura in its composition and especially in the figures placed in the foreground. Another of the paintings is by Renoir and bears the dedication to my friend Bonnard. Bonnard and Renoir share the same enthusiasm for the light of the Mediterranean. Let us accompany the painter on one of his early morning walks in the hills overlooking the Bay of Cannes. The artist captures his impressions in quick sketches. The dots and lines simultaneously denote the colors, which he mixes later in his studio. Thus, light and form emerge from the play of colored masses without the assistance of values or shadows. He observes, drawing is feeling, color an act of reason. In 1909, while visiting the painter Henri Monguin in Saint-Tropez, Bonnard discovers the beauty of the south of France for himself. He later reflects, 
It seemed to me like something from a thousand and one nights. In his painting, Bonnard is not concerned with content, with depiction of people or the representation of events. His theme is the arrangement of colors and forms. Through constant effort, he is finally able to achieve in pictures painted in his studio the spontaneous reproduction of an impression. Like a novelist such as Proust, who sitting at his desk creates literature from the diversities of Parisian life. The painter summarizes the creative process as follows. It is not a question of painting life, but rather of giving life to painting. One of the most important events of the painter's life is his meeting with Claude Monet. In 1912, Bonnard acquires a house near Vernon, which he calls Maroulotte, my caravan. The terrace affords a glimpse of the Seine through the trees and overgrown vegetation. Nearby, in his garden at Giverny, Monet is working on his first water lily paintings. It is possible to see Monet's influence in the meticulously composed paintings of this period. This is only to be expected since Bonnard saw a great deal of his neighbor. Even after close study, it is not easy to distinguish the various influences on Bonnard's painting. In his youth, Bonnard belonged to the avant-garde. He collaborated on the Revue Blanche and designed sets for Alfred Jarry's Ubu Roi. In Bonnard, anarchism and bourgeois reason are evenly balanced. He remains true to himself, belongs to no movement, and is simply concerned with creating something individual. He is critical of Cubism and declares, Cubism was detrimental to those who had no formal training. For those who could paint, it was useful. Bonnard is receptive to the paintings of his contemporaries. He keeps himself informed by visiting exhibitions and galleries. But after the Nabi, he joins no new movement. He wants only to be a painter of feelings. He himself remarks, A painter of feelings creates a self-contained world. A painting is like a book. It retains its meaning wherever it is hung. One always imagines that such painters spend a lot of time doing nothing, just observing their surroundings and meditating. They are rare birds indeed. In his later paintings, the use of colour borders on abstraction. Bonnard comes close to the Monet of the first water lily paintings. For Bonnard, colour is everything. Another glance at the studio wall reveals, next to the water lily, Vermeer's A Street in Delft, together with several other postcards. Take these reproductions, for instance. You can make something beautiful out of anything. So says Bonnard, and the banal subject of the picture he painted in 1929, entitled The Palm, proves his point. Let us turn now to another postcard. 
This one has not been stuck to the studio wall. It is a view of Amsterdam sent to him in 1925. The sender was Henri Matisse. Vive la peinture, long live painting. These words of encouragement bear witness to a long friendship. The two painters had met in 1910, a time when Bonnard's painting was undergoing radical change. 1925, Vive la peinture. Bonnard uses this motto as the title of one of his paintings. Fifteen years later, the two painters become particularly close. Bonnard now lives at Le Canet, at Matisse, at Simier, above Nice. During the austerity of the Second World War, both painters are lonely, and they pay each other frequent visits and correspond. Their exchange of letters is a wonderful testimony to their deep friendship. On the 7th of September, Matisse writes to Bonnard, I think it would do me the world of good to pay you a visit. In any case, the sight of your painting makes life more bearable. And as far as my work is concerned, it helps me to adopt a more relaxed attitude. Bonnard to Matisse, May 1946. Your two paintings embellish, yes, embellish my dining room. The ochre-coloured walls of the room provide the perfect background. In particular, the painting of the lady with a necklace seems to glow. In the evening, the red is magnificent, during the day, the blue is the dominant colour. What intensity! Every day I make new observations and am grateful to you for giving me a source both of pleasure and of visual instruction. There are further mysteries among the pictures on Bonnard's studio wall. This reproduction of a classical statue, for instance. against the light, painted in 1908, the reflection of his model, Marta, is possibly a conscious echo of a classical statue. The beauty of a classical marble statue is the sum of all the movements that went into its creation. The same is true of Bonnard's own paintings, as he himself says. A painting consists of a series of coloured marks which combine together to form the work on which the eye can linger undisturbed. The last reproduction on Bonnard's studio wall is the most difficult to account for. It is a cubist figure by Picasso. We know that Picasso did not like Bonnard's painting, and according to François Gillot, he expressed his opinion in no uncertain terms. I don't like Bonnard. I don't want anything to do with him. He is not a modern painter in the true sense of the word. He merely obeys nature. He doesn't transcend it. Bonnard is nothing more than a neo-impressionist, a decadent. Mm. 
Bonner is deeply hurt by the hostility of Picasso and his circle. In 1933, he writes to his nephew, Charles Terrasse. I am working hard and immersing myself more and more in that old-fashioned passion which for me is painting. Perhaps I am one of the last in this field. As if to give the lie to all his critics, it is during this period that he produces his most beautiful nudes. This is Marta, Bonnard's model, and since 1925, his wife. She shares his life for more than half a century. They met in 1893. In 1895, Bonnard paints her for the first time. Until her death in 1942, Bonnard paints Marta again and again in the intimacy of her personal surroundings. Marta has a delicate constitution. Doctors prescribe periods of convalescence and a change of air. Bonnard and Marta travel to Arcachon, Deauville, La Baule, Saint-Honoré-les-Bains, Luxeuil, and other spas. Even in hotels, the painter continues working, fixing his canvases to the walls with drawing pins. It seems that Bonnard has known only one passion in his uneventful life painting.
Despite the passage of time, Marta remains young in his paintings. Could it be that the painter was always conjuring up the ideal picture of the love of his youth? Or was it that Marta was afraid of old age and always insisted on being painted as a young woman? One painting seems to refer to Marta's death. It is the painting completed in 1943 entitled Interior at Le Canet. On the left-hand side of the picture, a female nude fades into the darkness, whilst on the right, an abandoned blue powder puff catches the eye and, like a fetish, conjures up a female presence. Bonnar paints his self-portraits with unflinching honesty. In them are captured his sense of time running out, his weariness of life, and the inexorable decline of his health. These paintings are moments of truth in which the painter gives away something of himself. Bonner does this with dignity and without any trace of vanity. These are moments of self-knowledge. The Japanese Nabi has become an oriental ascetic. November 1940, he writes to Matisse. My work is progressing very well. I dream of discovering the absolute. Bonner lets us share these dreams. He left behind a series of notebooks, with the aid of which we can reconstruct the development of his oeuvre. For close on 30 years, the painter uses sketches to capture fleeting impressions. There is not one of Bonner's paintings which is not based on a sketch. As well as the sketches, the notebooks contain other entries, including daily observations on the weather, wherever Bonner happened to be. He is interested less in the events of each day than in the meteorological conditions. Nice weather, but cold. Vermilion mingles with the orange shadows. Violet mingles with the grey.
The sketches are studies for the paintings. Bonner later mixes the colours for them in his studio. But what kind of development do these paintings reveal? A closer examination of this painting, landscape in Normandy, painted in 1930, reveals figures which the painter allows almost to dissolve into the colours. Bonnard invites the viewer to concentrate only on the colours. The painting borders on abstraction. And in his notebook he expresses the thought. People always speak of the power of nature, but there is also the power of a painting. The red checkered tablecloth, painted in 1910, makes us question our normal way of looking at things. The painter chooses a super-elevated point of view and divides the picture up into vertical and horizontal areas to which he apportions particular colour values. Fifteen years after the red checkered tablecloth, he paints the table. The source of light is now electric. Once again, the painter is not restricted by classical conceptions of perspective. Our attention is drawn first to Marty's rather curious posture. Could the painter have got the proportions wrong? Only when we notice the dog's nose rubbing against Marty does the coherence of the painting become apparent. In Corner of the Table, painted in 1935, Bonner seems to want to defy the laws of perspective and gravity. The individual objects seem to propel themselves away on coloured shadows, while a chair in the background seems to recede. The way in which the edge of the picture cuts across the objects is also typical. In 1944, he paints The Bowl of Fruit, in which he plays with colour and light. As early as 1921, Bonnard paints The Open Window, a composition which plays with our perceptions of things. The eccentric division produced by the window frame guides the viewer's gaze to the landscape. Only then do we notice the sleeping woman on the right-hand side of the painting. As he explains to his friend Handloser, I need an empty space in the middle of the picture when I begin to paint.
In 1901, he paints The Family in the Garden, a skillfully composed scene in which the figures are all members of his family. Nephews, nieces, parents, grandparents. In the garden of the family house at Grand Long in the Dauphine. The figures are arranged as on a photograph. Only colour brings life to the composition and communicates something of the tender atmosphere of the scene. Young Woman in the Garden was painted in 1920 and reworked in 1945. It is an example of Bonnard's attitude to time. As the power and brilliance of the color yellow begins to fascinate him towards the end of his life, he simply transforms the harmless chit-chat of the women of the twenties. He notes, In a work of art, time stands still. During the great upheavals of 1917, the painter works on a large decorative commission, Summer. Contemporary history finds no echo in his work. Even catastrophes seem hardly to affect him. He lives his one passion, painting. Even the turbulent post-war years leave no trace in his work. However, that does not mean that Bonnard the man did not move with the times. He had a weakness for fast cars, for instance. Until the beginning of the 30s, Bonnard lives and works predominantly in Paris. Then there comes one of those characteristic turning points. His painting moves in new directions and becomes almost a meditation in colours. Now I spend scarcely two months of the year in Paris. There I find stimuli and compare my paintings with the work of other painters. In Paris I am a critic. I can no longer work there. It is too loud and there are too many distractions. His last great painting of Paris was commissioned by his friend Georges Bresson and painted in 1925. It is the Café du Petit Pousset, a quiet café. The clientele are enjoying themselves in contemplative mood. No one is in a hurry. Who still remembers that Bonnard first became famous for, of all things, an advertisement of France Champagne? The painter is as oblivious of time as his figures. He works on this small painting entitled The Pier for eight years before giving it to his Swiss friends Arthur and Hedy Hanloser. He needs this length of time to find and rectify the error which disturbs the balance of the composition. Look, I have increased the effect of the yellow. Now everything is perfectly balanced and I think the work, though small, has not turned out badly at all.
Sailing depicts one of the few simple pleasures which Bonnar readily allowed himself. The painting is also a portrait of the Handlosers and their daughter Lisa. Bonnar was first introduced to the Handloser family in 1910 by Felix Vallotton. They are well-to-do Swiss citizens, a pleasant change from the Parisian dealers and collectors. Thanks to sustained effort and a profound understanding of art, they managed to bring together with the utmost discretion an important collection of works by Bonner and Matisse, as well as paintings by Degas, Gauguin and Van Gogh. In order to be near their artist friends, who have all moved to the south of France, the Handlosers buy a villa in the Croisette of Cannes, as well as a boat for expeditions. This is the only existing film of Pierre Bonnard. It was shot by Adrien Mecht one summer afternoon in 1946, during a picnic in honour of the painter. The art historian Jean Levmarie remembers this expedition. I can see him before me in my mind's eye, transfigured by memory in the brilliant light of summer. I can see his every movement, swimming a little apart from the rest, his body resembling that of an oriental ascetic in the fiery light of the sun. And as we walked together, he stepped lightly over the ground covered with dry twigs, enjoying the smells and breathing in the clean air. He tasted the food like a gourmet, and then retired for a short siesta beneath the trees, keeping his eyes half shut like a dreamer and half open like a cat ready to pounce. I can still hear him speaking across the space of the years, sensitive and reserved, receptive to everyone. The light has never seemed so beautiful to me, reveals Bonner that same day to Jean Lemarie as the sun sets behind Lesterel. His paintings of this period are a lyrical tribute to this light, but they also sound a more troubled note. These bathers, glowing in the late afternoon sunlight, immersed in an acid sea, evoke a different twilight. This horse, so unlike Bonnard's other paintings, has the force of an evil spectre. This Mediterranean landscape seems to be the sum of all the painter's experiments. A glowing earth and a sky dominated by the colours red and orange. Everything becomes colour and colour becomes light. It is no longer possible to discern a subject. The 80-year-old painter explains. In art, it is only the reaction which matters. In his old age, Bonnard takes up Mallarmé once again, who says, just as Bonnard might have said, to name an object directly is to rob oneself of a large part of the joy of a poem, which consists in describing something little by little, by suggestion. 
that is my dream. In his search for light, Bonner arrives at pure color, the absolute. So he is able to say, a painting consists of a series of colored marks which combine together to form the work on which the eye can linger undisturbed. He was well aware that he was treading new ground, and yet he belonged to no movement. He looked to the future full of pride. I hope that my paintings will age well. To the young painters of the year 2000, I would like to appear carefree and timeless. <laughs>